All right, welcome to Quasi Super Bowl Sunday. How many of you care? All right. If you had to choose, how many, how many are kind of rooting for Denver? Mostly just because of Peyton. I mean, let's be honest, if it was someone else or Brock Osweiler, I'd be like, yeah. But Peyton, yeah, we, we can get on board with that. Okay, well, I'm excited that we get to talk about discipleship today. And uh, this is kind of a, a special service because it's a little bit of a two-parter. First part, we're going to just talk about the heart of discipleship, uh, what Jesus called us to do. And so, you know, we'll actually have a sermon, don't worry. Um, but then part of it, I'm going to bore you to tears. For all of you who are not youth parents, I'm going to talk about the youth vision. So if you are not a youth parent or a youth, you may find this part, the second part, hard to get through. Unless, and I've, I've decided this, unless you use this Sunday to make the decision to finally become a member of youth ministry. So as a way of fighting the boredom and staying engaged, sign up for youth ministry and then this will apply to you. I have no problem with that. All right, let's stand and read God's word. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that, Lord, this is what you do. This is how, this is how you gave us your model for being your disciples. Lord, show us something today. Pull our hearts into alignment with yours. Remove the obstacles, remove the fears, remove the concerns that keep us from fully following you. Lord, you're the only one worth following. Lord, help us to hunger after you today. In your name, amen. So we're going to talk about the invitation and the challenge, and actually I've got a third part that's not in the title. It's called the promise. We'll get to that later. Um, but the first part is the invitation, and I think all of us would say we're okay with the invitation that Jesus gives, amen? All right, who likes, who likes being saved? I like it. Who likes freedom from sin? Yeah, we like it. I mean, that wasn't really that exciting. I always am trying to get you more excited. I know it's my bit, and I know it gets old and cheesy because I'm the youth pastor, but be more excited about this. <laughs> I mean, this is the greatest news ever told. This is the reason we exist. God created us not only to, to glorify him, but to be loved by him, which is the greatest gift in ever, that God himself loves us intimately and passionately and sacrificed for us. He paid all of the cost of our sin with his son's death and resurrection and provided the way for us to have relationship again with him. He healed the wound. He brought us back. He paved the way. We're okay with that. We like that part. It just happens when I'm right here, right? Let's, let's try that. <laughs> at, at Cornerstone staff meetings, we always joke, like, every Sunday there's a technical thing and no one can see it coming, it just happens. It happens, it's okay. Do you guys care? Amen, all right. We like what Jesus has to offer us. Maybe you're still seeking, maybe you're still thinking, you're not sure about it. Let me tell you, it's good. 
We can all attest to that. Talk to some people here. They will tell you it's amazing. Don't let the little response that I just got, the little clapping, fool you. It's better than that. <laughs> we love Jesus, and we love his sacrifice, and we love that he died for us, and we love the invitation that we get to be adopted as children of God, that we are co-heirs with Christ, that we are, we are princes and princesses of God's heavenly kingdom. We love that. But the part we don't love is the obedience. That's the hard part. And somehow we've decided that we can accept the invitation, but we don't actually have to follow through with the obedience part because it's hard and uncomfortable. And I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to make it seem like it's perfect. Everyone following Jesus is hard. Following Jesus is hard. But I will say this. In the words of the great Jimmy Dugan, the immortal coach from A League of Their Own, played by the wonderful Tom Hanks, it is the hard that makes things great. Following Jesus is hard because it's great, because it's worthy because it's worthwhile, because it's all-encompassing and life-changing, and it actually makes a difference, not only in this life, but in eternity. It's being called into something beyond ourselves. It's hard in the sense of stepping forward and following, but it's easy because God supplies everything we lack. He makes up for our failings. He makes up for our our issues or our hang-ups. So, so whatever we say about ourselves, we say, you know, I'm not outgoing enough or, you know, I don't know enough or I'm just not really that kind of person. I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I could share my faith. I don't know if I can follow in that way. I don't know, God, if you call me into missions, I can go. I have a career. I have a family. I don't know, God, if you're calling me to, to witness to my family for the first time about, about faith. I don't know if I could do that. It could make things uncomfortable for me. God's going to take care of them. He promises us that. So if you're willing to have faith in the invitation of Christ, are you willing to have faith in the promises of Christ? Because he does promise us that he will do this. We're okay with the invitation. Come. But he, he immediately follows it up. He says, come and This is the part where you speak. Come and come and follow. Come and follow me. He doesn't say come, think about it, sit, go get trained, spend some time alone, get some meals, get some more meals. He says come and follow me. You can't divorce it. You can't separate it. It's, it's linked. Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, God links the invitation with the challenge. Because to disregard the challenge is to not fully accept the invitation. And you can't do that. You can't accept the saving aspect of God. You can't accept his salvation and not agree to his lordship. It's one and the same. And maybe you say, I know this. this is, is this the kid's sermon? I've been through this before. I mean, we're past this. Are you? Are we? Am I? We say we are. Let's think about this. What do you see Jesus doing mostly in the Gospels? Where does he spend most of his time? In the, in the years of his ministry where he was modeling for us what a Christian life looks like, what do we see him doing? Where is he? Let's, let's start slow. Anybody want to shout out a guess? Come on, we're going to start talking to people about our faith. We can at least talk about our faith just here amongst ourselves, right? Where is he? Where's Jesus? 
He's out in the world. Is he in the synagogue? Is he at home by himself? He's out in the world with the people. And what is he doing most of the Gospels? What do you see written about? Does it say, and Jesus sat for seven days in a deep, intensive Tim Keller Bible study, having great small group discussion questions? Does it say, and thus he went to seminary to achieve the all-powerful, all-amazing Master of Divinity degree? For that will make him the divine master. We see Jesus mostly out amongst the people spreading the gospel through words and through action, healing the sick, feeding people, making a difference, correcting wrong ideas about who God is, and actually living it out so people could get a glimpse of the way God was always supposed to be viewed. He was incarnate living amongst us. And that's most of the Gospels. And yet we as Christians, I mean, yes, he did study. And yes, he did pray. And yes, he did get alone. But that's not the majority of what he did. But somehow that's what we've made the majority of our Christian lives about. And then the rest of the stuff we kind of ignore. We'll get to it later. We'll get to this discipling others thing later. We'll get to this taking care of people thing later. We'll get to this healing the sick thing later. I got to spend my time in this. I got to be better, pray, better prayed up and equipped and, and spend more time in study. And those things are wrong. Please don't misunderstand me on this. I mean, I want you to study. I want you to pray, obviously. But there is so much more to following Jesus than just those things. That's the challenge. Follow me. They would have immediately understood because of the time that when Jesus just came up to them and said, hey, follow me, that he was a rabbi and he was inviting them along to actually follow with him and live with him and watch what he did and start to model and mold it into their lives and become like him. To be a disciple of their rabbi. We can't just accept Jesus and his salvation. We have to accept him and agree to doing what he did in the way that he did it, with the heart that he did it. It has to be all or nothing. That's the problem we have in our world. Maybe if you're new here and you're going, this is a different service, and you're saying, yeah, what is it with Christians? I mean, I know they're supposed to act a certain way, but anytime I talk to them, I just, I don't get a sense that they're really doing what I see or know about Jesus. It's because we're not. And you're right, and I'm sorry for that, and I apologize for that. It's become very easy for us to just be comfortable Christians. You should have seen Christians, and hopefully you've seen Christians, who really get this, who really care about the sick, who care about the hurting, who love passionately and who forgive constantly and live in a constant state of grace and mercy. When Jesus comes to the disciples, when he, when he sees them, he says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they were fishermen, right? So they're fishing, they're doing something. And it's not like he's saying, Hey, I got a different job for you. He puts it in their context. He says, hey, become fishers of men. There's something more worthwhile that you can be doing with your time. Fishing is great, but I'm going to teach you something better. And see, that's the call and the challenge of God and Jesus in our lives is, yes, we accept him, but he calls us to something more, and it is better. It's a better way to live. I have a sense that if Jesus came today, he would come to the churches and he would talk to us and say, come live out the gospel with me instead of in here. There's a better way.
He's always inviting us to come and join him in something spectacular, something amazing. Wherever God is is where we want to be. Amen? And maybe you say, you know, my faith isn't as vibrant as it once was. I, I don't have that same zeal I did when I was a fresh Christian, when I first accepted, when I first saw people giving their lives to God and, and getting right with him. It's because you're not around it anymore. <laughs> it's because I'm not around it anymore. Because God is still saving people. God is still making a difference in people's lives. God is still calling people to himself. And he's always living and active and moving, and he's not waiting on us. It's our job to go find him and join him in his activity, in what he's doing. Not always trying to bring him to what we're doing. We have to go and get in the path of our rabbi and follow him. And you say, though, I don't know. I don't know if I have time. I don't know if I have the training. What if I talk to people and they ask me questions I don't know the answers to? I'm, I'm not an extrovert. I'm an introvert. I'm an introvert. Maybe you don't believe that, but I'm scared every time I'm up here. Maybe... You just feel like your life isn't ready. You're not in the right place to actually be out in the world sharing your faith. You're ready. You don't have enough knowledge, you've got enough knowledge. Because everything that you need is supplied by God. Everything comes from that first step of faith. If God tells you to do something, step out. He will supply the rest. How do I know this? It's what he says. Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Not, you will become fishers of men. Not someday they will call you fishers of men. And maybe in your new version of the NIV it says, you know, you will become or something like that. But don't listen to that. The actual translation is make. And that's important because that's what God says. That's what Jesus, God in a bod, is saying. He's saying, I will make you fishers of men. It'll be up to me for you to get this right. It's not up to you. Your job is just to come and follow me, and I will make the rest happen. Hopefully there's freedom in that for us. Now, I'm not saying we're not going to do equipping. We're going to do equipping. I'm not saying you don't need maybe some training here and there. Sure, we're going to do that. But all the training and all the equipping and all the, the extra stuff that we do won't matter if you're not willing to take that first step of faith and just be used by God. That's going to be the hardest part. It might be easy to say, okay, let's put that off. I'm going to go train for a while. And if, if, if you feel like you need training, absolutely, please come. But if you're using it as a crutch, if you're using it as an excuse, a way to put following God off for a while, be careful there. Don't miss out on what God is calling you to do. Don't miss out on the joy of being completely used by God and knowing that you had nothing to do with it because for, as far as you were concerned, you weren't ready. It was all God. Amen. That's what God does. Where in the Bible do you ever see God calling someone and they said, yeah, I'm ready. It's me. Maybe a couple. But most of the time, like Gideon and, and Moses and some others, God says, hey, you're the guy. And they say, no, not me. I'm not ready. You must be thinking of someone else. Right? Why did God do that? Because he's showing us over and over and over again, you're not going to be ready. You're going to swear that you're not ready. You're gonna, every part of you is going to say, I'm not worthy. I'm not ready. It's not the right time. And God says, I'm God. If I say you're ready, you're ready. Because I'm there. Your job is just to follow me. Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. 
Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. That scares me. It scares me to think that that could be true in our lives. That we may think we're okay with God, that we're actually doing his will, but we're every day missing the boat. That scares me for myself. That scares me for you. It scares me for the kids. To be a Christian is to be a little Christ. It's to be so rooted in God's activity that at every moment we're in his will and our, our, our spiritual lives are passionate and full and we see God being God. And we know that we're his. And we see the evidence of it in our lives and in the fruit of our lives. We can't have that ignoring most of what Jesus did. We can't have that putting off discipling and discipleship and caring about those who don't know him. We can't put that off. We have to care. We have to live as Jesus lived. He spent every moment of his time dedicated to sharing who God was and to and to inviting people into the kingdom of heaven. Do we do that? Or do we keep saying, not yet, I'm not ready. Because what I see in, in the disciples, the people that are the disciples of Jesus, here's what it says, another, um, back in chapter 4. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men at once. They left their nets and followed him. And he sees James and John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets. Jesus called them and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. When God calls you, move. If God has told you that this is something that needs to be in our lives, it's not later, it's now. Here comes the next part. We're going to talk about the youth vision a little bit. And the reason we have this, I feel, is because God, God is calling us, all of us, but for my part and for the elders' part, the youth, in a certain way, towards discipleship. And it's going to be a group thing. It's going to be all of us as the body living as Jesus lived. I do want to talk about specifically the youth part, but as adults, I mean, just to give you a really quick, quick idea, this is what we're going to do. We're going to be out in the world. We're going to talk to people, as awkward as that may seem and sound, and as scary as that may sound. We're going to talk to people, and we're going to look for opportunities to share our faith with them, and we're going to be faithful to God in sharing our faith. We're going to look for someone that what we're calling is a person of peace, a person who's open and receptive to the gospel, who's interested in Jesus and interested in his ways. And naturally, not forced, we're just going to share. And maybe we'll get to a point where we can invite someone to sit down and read scripture with us. And we're going to meet with them and we're going to read scripture. And we'll go through that. And maybe we'll get to a point where we say, you know, you want to join me in just meeting with some other Christians and living life, being out in the world, loving people, caring about people, doing things? Watching Super Bowls we don't care about? That's what we call a community group. And so, you know, us and some, some cornerstone people that are also doing this, we're going to invite our friends that we've been talking to. And I'm telling you, I'm scared about this. I don't know any non-Christians anymore. I am thoroughly entrenched in the Christian bubble. I have no non-Christian friends. And it's not because I'm an amazing evangelist and I've turned them all Christian. <laughs> I could say that, but no, it's not true. I only know Christians. Mostly cornerstone Christians, too. I know you guys, and even then, if you're not a youth or a youth parent, I may not know you. 
It's scary for me. I don't know what this is going to look like, but it's going to require faith. But man, I am excited because I don't know about you, but I've been a Christian long enough to know that I'm tired of a half faith. I'm tired of really just trying to get through it. I want to feel God. I want to see God in action. So for the youth, this is what we're going to do. Uh, no? All right. I had slides, but I screwed them up because I'm really bad at PowerPoint. And so we don't have slides. <laughs> uh, thanks, Thomas, for trying. I appreciate it, buddy. Give Thomas a hand, man. He's, he's hardcore. All right. So, youth. Life focus. First change. Uh, we're going to keep life focus weekly. In case anybody was wondering. Um, but the last week of the month, we're going to change it slightly. What we're going to do is we're going to take that last week, so the last Saturday of every month, we're going to turn it into an equipping and training time for the changes that we're making on Sunday. All right, so Sunday, what we're doing is right now, currently, we have four Sunday school classes, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th, okay? Um, they're running simultaneously. We've got six curriculums that go on a rotation basis. We're teaching you tons of different things. We're actually, even though it took three years to finally get it to where we like it, we're going to do away with that. We're going to wipe it because God is good. And we're going to say, you know what, we're, this is what we're going to try. This is our vision. This is our hope. We're going to do a large group teaching. And it'll be like a youth sermon. It's going to mirror the adult sermon, all right? So whatever you as adults are learning, the youth will also be learning, Okay? So they're going to get like a 20, 25-minute sermon. No, you can't come to the shorter sermon just because you feel like it. <laughs> Unless you want to be a youth minister. <laughs> 20, 25-minute sermon, uh, mirroring the adult topics. And then once that's done, we'll break up into little facilitation groups. I do need facilitators. So if you want to be a youth facilitator who sits in the sermon, listens to the sermon, and then helps the youth apply it to their lives, please sign up. It's going to be cool. Why are we doing this? There's a lot of statistics that show we lose a lot of youth once they graduate from high school. And maybe this is your experience, but and I know it was for me. You go off to college, and nothing feels right because you've left Sunday school, and you've left youth group, and you've been in your Christian bubble, and you go off to college, and you try to find a church, but eh, it doesn't really feel like home, and so you start church hopping. You go to different churches. Um, nothing feels right, and eventually it just becomes kind of easy because of school and all the stuff you got going on just to drop it. And next thing you know, maybe you drop church altogether. And a lot of the studies show 10 to 15 years can go by. And you may not come back to God until you're 28 or 30. We want to kill that gap. So what we want to do is we want to acclimate our students to a sermon-style environment quicker. So we're going to put that into our Sunday school in place. The other part it does that I really love is because we as a body are all learning the same thing, you can talk about it. So if you're a young adult and you're just not sure what to talk to the youth about, you can talk to them about the sermon. If you're a parent and you're having trouble really discipling your kids, you're not sure where, uh, where that connecting point can come from, talk about the sermon. It's a great discipleship platform. So that's going to happen. Um, the other cool thing is currently right now the youth serve in the rock classes with the kids as helpers. Uh, we think they can do more than that. I know they can do more than that. We have amazing youth. I mean, they're solid people. So one of the things we're going to do is on the first Sunday of the month, instead of having uh, rock all the way through, there will still be rock from nursery all the way to second grade, right, Warren? Or first grade to first grade. All the way to first grade. But from second to fifth, the kids will be in a service of their own, and the youth are going to run it. Crazy, I know. But it's good. I've seen it. It's amazing. So the youth are going to have ownership of ministry. They're going to teach your kids. And let's be honest, your kids love learning from big kids. Amen? They think big kids are way cooler than we could ever hope to be. And it's true. So I can just see them soaking up the lessons. It's going to be powerful. What we're doing on that last Saturday of the month is we're going to use that as the equipping and training time for the Sunday that the youth will be running service for the kids. The other thing we're doing, small groups. Small groups. All of our small groups are going to be open from now on. We, right now, we have six youth small groups that meet at different times, different areas. They're going to be open. 
to invite their friends. So how we as adults are doing D, uh, discipleship groups or discipling groups, DGs, right? Okay. <laughs> We're tweaking the name possibly, so. All right, discipling groups uh, and community groups. We're going to merge that. So the youth small groups are going to be a bit of a hybrid, all right? So discipleship will happen in that sphere, in that realm. So for a youth, if you're a youth and you're inviting your friends, maybe it's hard for you to invite them to church. Maybe church scares them. But you can invite them to youth group. That's one thing. Or you can invite them to your small group because there's not 50 kids running around. And there's only like five or six, right? It's a little less intimidating. So you'll invite them into your small group. And small group will be a very honest and transparent place where people are praying for one another and sharing and talking about faith. It's going to be awesome. I love it. So those are the ideas. Those are the the plans. The equipping part is going to happen in a couple different stages. Let uh, Let me go to my notes so I don't give any wrong dates. So in spring... For the youth, we're going to take them through the three-question Bible study that we'll be doing in the DGs. Uh, We're going to incorporate that into our small groups. In summer, there's a five-week curriculum that we're also going to do in our small groups that's basically um, just how to have conversations about God, how to talk, you know, different ways you can live as an intentional person living out the gospel in the world. And then in fall, we're going to restart our apologetics curriculum, but we're going to do it at Life Focus. We did this in Sunday school, and uh, it was fun. Kids learned everything about all different faiths and worldviews, and honestly, a lot of the emails I got from the parents were like, can I have that class? I need to learn that. Um, It'll be great. I love it. So we're going to use it as kind of a little bit of both. It's going to be both instructional for for our students who already believe, but it'll also be welcoming for people who are just checking out Christianity and checking out faith. We'll talk about it. Talk about the difference between Hinduism and Christianity and what they believe. It's going to be fun. But all of this, all of this, hinges on one of the more direct aspects of equipping. You as adults, now let me just talk to you adults. All of you, not just parents. You're part of the body. And we we talked about this in youth ministry, all my leaders, we talked about this, about how, where's the time going to come from? You know, we're doing small groups, we're doing life focus, and we're going to do discipling groups and actually be out and living this out in the world? I mean, is that too much? And everybody said, I want to. Let's do both. Because I need to do that. And because if I don't do that, what do I have to offer the youth? Somebody once said that your personal walk with God is the only thing you really have to offer anyone as a teacher or as a leader or even as a parent. And that's true. The reality of your life lived with God is the most powerful part of what you have to share with someone. So if you care about your kids, and I know you do, if you care about your brothers and sisters in this room, I know you do, be a part of this. Be willing to take that step forward and to begin discipling in a powerful way so that one, we can, as a body, hold each other accountable and we can share our failures and there will be failures and successes and we can encourage one another, but also so you can help equip the next generation. Because here's the thing that really kind of haunts me, is no one did this for me. No one showed me how to do this, and someone should have. We each should have had a rabbi, and maybe you did, and maybe that was a great God thing in your life. But we each should have had a rabbi that was talking into our life and modeling how to live this out. But what we had mostly were people well-intentioned who taught us how to study the Bible, and that's good, who taught us how to pray, and that's good, who taught us how to be responsible and respectful, who taught us how to gain insight from sermons. But did we have anyone teach us and show us what it was to actually share faith in the context of life? Let's end that cycle. Let's be this for the next generation, and so on and so forth. Let's reclaim that part of our culture, the biggest part of who Jesus is and what he does and what he did. Let's live the way Jesus lived. Let's pray. I'm going to invite the worship team up. 
the intercessors are going to be on the sides. So if you're struggling with this, I would really encourage you, just make your way to the sides. Be honest. I guarantee you the person you're praying with is scared too. That this is going to be hard. This is going to be tough. Share with them your fears and your concerns. Lord God, we don't want to ignore you. We don't want to ignore any part of you, let alone most of you. Lord, forgive us for spending so much time doing so little of what you did and yet calling ourselves Christians. Lord, forgive us for not caring enough about the hurting and the lost. Lord, change our hearts. Help us. Pull us into your will, Lord. Lord, we want to join you in your activity. We want to do what you're doing. We want to see you at work, God. We've been apart from you for too long, Lord. Lord, we don't want the half faith. We don't want a life half lived. Lord, you're clear on that. You'd rather we were hot or cold. You don't care for lukewarm. And Lord, we've been lukewarm. Lord, you desire passionate follow. Lord, stir the passion in our hearts. Lord God, call us into something more and give us the faith to step forward into that life that you have for us, that you've always had for us. And Lord, take away our fears, take away our concerns and our doubts. Take away my fears and my doubts. Lord, we need you. We need all of you. I'm tired of part of you, Lord. I want all of you. Lord, call us into this life and give us the nudge we need to step forward, that you will make us. You promise us, Lord. Lord, honor your promise. You will make us like you. If we would only follow you. We thank you for that, Lord, in your name. Amen.